welcome, and I suppose our speaker tonight probably needs no real introduction based on how many of you are here. But just in case you wanted him by accident, he's a writer for the Mail on Sunday, a World Prize winning journalist, author of multiple books on a variety of topics including politics, crime, religion and drugs. And he's also a, a very experienced foreign correspondent, and tonight we're lucky enough to be hearing firsthand about his, not only his experience, but from his unique perspective. So I hope you'll join me in giving him a very warm welcome. I'm afraid she didn't mention that I also narrowly failed to gain selection to the Olympic team last year for the little-known sport of starting an argument in an empty room. I argued too much with the selectors. Uh, the, the, simple, uh, the simple point that I've come to make, I will, I will make fairly briefly because it, it is an argument that I really most of all want to have about Russia, about foreign policy, about liberty, about what should really concern us about other people's countries. But I begin by explaining that part of my reason for this is that, for better or worse, I've been forced rather to like both Russia and Russians. I spent two and a half years living in Moscow at the end of the Soviet era, uh, and I saw the communist regime depart and collapse in the middle of a coup. I had tanks coming up the street in which I lived, and I witnessed an awful lot of things that I don't think any of you will ever see, and I hope that none of you ever will, because they have gone from the earth. But the Soviet Union in which I lived was genuinely an evil empire, genuinely a, a rather menacing and frightening place. I lived in a block of apartments on Kutuzovsky Prospect in Moscow, and my neighbours were mainly KGB men and members of the Soviet elite. The Brezhnev family lived across the courtyard, and it was clearly a place which was run very secretively, uh, very brutally, and in, a, in an utterly privileged fashion. A small anecdote to illustrate the level of privilege which I gained simply by living in this block of flats. The Moscow traffic police notoriously extremely corrupt, and if you had to, as I did as a foreign correspondent, drive through Moscow with special plates on your car, identifying you as such, you were constantly being stopped and, and, and accused of driving at incredible speeds and asked to pay enormous fines, which were, of course, bribes. One evening, coming back from a press conference, I, very, very late on a snowy night, I ignored one of these patrols, thinking, the heck with it. And unusually, they were quite lazy as well as corrupt, they chased me into the courtyard of the building. <coughs> and they pulled up behind me and they demanded my papers. And I gave them my papers, my passport with my Moscow residence permit and my, my Soviet driving license. And they shouted at me, how dare you drive past us, how dare you ignore us. And they threw my passport and my papers into the slush at my feet. And they said, anyway, what are you doing in here? And I said, I live here. At which point they stopped. The officer picked up my passport and my papers from the slush, handed them back to me, saluted got back into his car and drove away very, very fast indeed, because he was afraid of me. That was the nature of the Soviet regime, as it was. It was even a member of the royal family could have got that sort of treatment in this country at that time. In, in that immense privilege. There were other, all kinds of other things. The, what, you could go down uh, into, um, into the areas where the gulag had been and find people who had, had been prisoners under Stalin, still living, uh, in the towns in which they'd been imprisoned because their families had been wiped out while they'd been in, in the gulag camps. They had nowhere else to go, and they were still living among the people who guarded them. The place was a filthy slum of shortages and misery and corruption and laziness and dirt, and I hated it, and they all hated it too. And There was a film made which disgracefully has never been shown in this country, and this, this name will occur again in this conversation. <coughs> by a filmmaker called Stanislav Galryukin, who was a friend of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The film was called Takzhinizya, which means roughly we can't go on living like this, and it took the Politburo to decide to allow it to be shown. And I went to see it in a cinema in Moscow in the summer of 1990, and everyone in the cinema was weeping, because for the first time they saw the, the truth being told about the corruption, the desecration of the churches, the misery of their lives. And one of the scenes which was most striking was a, 
a long queue of people in a provincial city, respectable people dressed in, in, in smart, by Soviet standards, coats and hats, queuing up, waiting for the weekly ration of vodka on which their happiness pretty much depended. They looked more or less like a German, a German or, or, or perhaps a, a, an Austrian middle-class crowd, except for the background of horrible tablet. And then the word came through there was no vodka that week, and this crowd of respectable people descended into a horrible, spitting, snarling, punching, kicking riot. That was a measure of the desperation of the place. And the people saw this, they knew it, but to see it actually being publicly referred to by anybody, because it was never mentioned in the newspapers, it was never mentioned in the schools, it was never mentioned in political discourse, to see the state of their society mentioned, described in a film in public was enough to make them weep, to suddenly see the truth being told about something very evil. So I saw absolutely nothing but delight when it was swept away. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a couple of nights in, in August 1991 when the, the tanks came out and then the tanks withdrew and after that the Communist Party was over forever. So let me be absolutely clear on this. As far as the Cold War was concerned, I was a Cold Warrior, very much on the side of those who opposed the Soviet Union, who hated everything it stood for, who wanted it driven out of all those lovely capitals, the, the Prague and Budapest, and, and Berlin, and those people liberated and allowed to live their lives instead of, instead of being crushed under a horrible secret police empire. So let us have that all clear to begin with, and then skip a few years now to the arrival of Vladimir Putin <coughs> on the international scene, and the elections which were taking place in Moscow in February of last year. And the whole of the Western media and all the Western public opinion ceaselessly backing uh, Alexei Navalny and all the critics of Putin and saying it was time he was swept away and backing these white ribbon demonstrations in Moscow and saying this is, this is a bad man he should be got rid of. And I couldn't, I simply couldn't find myself in agreement with it because there was something, there were two things that I knew. One, that Russia is not the Soviet Union that Russia does not in any way threaten this country or Western Europe or anyone really except its immediate neighbours in any way. It has no interest in an ideological battle for control of the world. Talk of the new Cold War is so much tripe. There is no such thing intended, nothing, no desire in Russia to expand in that direction. It's false. Secondly, I thought, why of all the tyrants, and I still travel in the former Soviet Empire, in Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, or come to that in China. Why are all the tyrants in that part of the world, are we so particularly concerned about Vladimir Putin? And it came to me in a simple flash of revelation as I walked down the snowy street that I used to live in, thinking, what is this? Why are we having this conversation? Why this hatred of Putin? Why does everybody who knows nothing about Russia think this man of all the despots in the world should be overthrown? And it came to me. It's about national sovereignty. Russia is the one major country in the world which is not a superpower, but which is still prepared to assert its sovereignty, that is to say its, its desire to govern its own affairs, to run its own economy, to run its own politics, to pursue its own foreign policy, to run the, the, the kind of government which it itself chooses to have. And it sets itself completely against the new ideology first set out by Anthony Blair in a famous speech in Chicago shortly before the Iraq War. The new philosophy of the modern West, which is, if we don't like your regime for any reason, we will somehow or other start a war against you, overthrow you, and replace you with somebody else. This, as we all know, has been an immense success. Uh, look at Baghdad, uh, one of our early experiments in replacing the existing government with a new one. And there's nothing wrong at all with what happened in Baghdad, apart from the fact that the country is almost split into three uh, that it is constantly played with kidnapping, explosions, terrorism, and disorder in a failed state. Uh, and, is, and is effectively a failed state, as is Libya, where we intervened a couple of years ago, uh, as were it not for the presence of foreign armed forces, would most of Yugoslavia be. Uh, and as Syria is, thanks to the intervention which we contrive to begin, but cannot finish. This seemed to me to be immensely important because of another experience I had. Now, you may say, I don't much care if someone starts intervening in Yugoslavia, or as it was, or in Syria, or in Iraq, or in Libya, or in Egypt, or in any of these faraway countries. And it has absolutely no importance to you at all. 
But the principle has actually been applied here and could be applied here again. And I will tell you exactly how I know this because I was also living in Washington in the early 90s at a time when Jerry Adams of provisional Sinn Féin was trying to become an important political figure against, very much against the wishes of the British government. And I knew, because a good friend of mine was a correspondent of the Irish Times, exactly how much more powerful in the councils of Washington, our supposed closest ally in an alleged special relationship, how much more powerful in the councils of the White House and the State Department the IRA were than the British government were. That Jerry Adams was given his visa, that Jerry Adams was given his, his, his seal of approval, that Jerry Adams was allowed to tour the United States, raising funds, posing as a friend of civil rights by an American government which was determined to force this country to surrender to IRA terrorism in Northern Ireland. And I remember speaking with an official, a very senior official at the White House, about this, who'd been told off because she realised that some of the British press were not happy with this treatment. <coughs> and she said, as I, as, as I talked to her, she said, well, don't you think it's right for us to intervene in Yugoslavia then? And I said, do you seriously compare, there in the West Wing of the White House, do you seriously compare Britain, the, your, your closest ally, a long-standing member of NATO, a law-governed democracy with hundreds of years of, of, of history as a constitutionally governed state, do you seriously compare Britain with Yugoslavia? And there was a sort of silence, because that's exactly what she was doing. The United States believed that it had just as much right to intervene in our affairs when it suited us as it did in the affairs of Yugoslavia, or later on in Iran. And it seems to me that this principle of national sovereignty was one which was worth standing up for. If my own country hadn't done so, then I would, I would, I would very, very much be pleased if somebody else did so. And I thought that Vladimir Putin was coming under all this pressure, was being threatened by a, a colour revolution. You, possibly some of you will remember the supposed Orange Revolution in Kiev, or the Rose Revolution in Tbilisi in Georgia, which were uh, largely, in my view, contrived by Western money. <laughs> to overthrow governments by what would, under any other circumstances, be called mob rule, which is dignified by the modern media as people power. And I could see that something of the kind was being contrived for Vladimir Putin. And as the Syrian crisis proceeded, and as various governments, including our own, fought harder and harder and harder for a military intervention in Syria, which would have created, in my view, a terrible war, and turn the country already in, in, in very, very serious crisis into much, much worse crisis and chaos. I thought, again, this principle of national sovereignty is one which needs to be defended. Vladimir Putin is not merely defending it in his own country. He's defending it in Syria and in the Middle East. He's saying this idea that you can intervene in somebody else's country because you don't like its regime is one which is wrong, dangerous, and should be opposed. And anyone who's seriously concerned with international stability with peace, for ending this strange period of voluntary <laughs> war, which we entered into uh, in the, when was it now, I suppose the early, the early years of this, of this century, sh should actually be very interested that there is somebody who's prepared to take this line. Now, I know, I know about Sergei Mag Magnitsky and about the appalling treatment of that man in a, in a Moscow jail. I know about Pussy Riot. I know, about, I know about Khodorkovsky, I know about all the other things which Vladimir Putin has undoubtedly presided over, which are unquestionably wrong. These criticisms are unanswerable. But I also know that there are similar criticisms which could easily be made of several other countries, notably the People's Republic of China, uh, where we currently have a very high-level delegation groveling for trade and favours. And that the, the idea that you can be principled about the wrongdoing of one regime and have no principles about the wrongdoing of another, suggesting that we don't actually have any principles at all. That if these reasons aren't universal reasons, they aren't your real reasons. And that we should begin to examine this constant urge, propagandized by academics, propagandized by politicians, propagandized by our own Prime Minister, propagandized by the BBC, that there is a duty in this country, and a duty in all major countries to intervene in the affairs of foreign countries. It's time it came to an end. Putin stands against it. That's why I like it. That's what I came here to say. If any of you want to argue with me, I'm here. I guess this means we're in questions. So thank you very much.
isn't Putin intervening by um, uh, supplying Syria with weapons? Uh, certainly Russia does supply Syria with weapons, but I think it's just as, as Russia has a vestigial <coughs> naval base at Tartus and, and various other connections. But I don't think that these are, are major concerns. Actually, from what I can discover, the, the Soviet, the, the, sorry, the Russian, important distinction, the Russian government does not have very good or friendly relations with Syria. Uh, its decision to protect Syria from international action is not because of a liking for that regime or because of any hope of commercial gain, uh, but because of a general feeling that if this principle of national sovereignty is not re-established, then the next country to go will be Russia. And in, 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 in an era when, when, when this is probably the, the major development of our time, look, I'll just go back to 1649 for a moment. It, it, there was in, in 1999 an international celebration of the 350th anniversary of the Peace of Westphalia, at the end of the Thirty Years' War, which you will, of course, all know. And the reason for this was that this was the moment in which the power, great powers of Europe had said, in future, we will not intervene in the internal affairs of other countries, because the Thirty Years' War had devastated most of Europe. Most of Europe looked like a Hieronymus Bosch painting at the end of the Thirty Years' War. The population of Europe had gone down significantly. Great cities had been reduced to ashes. And the, the idea that you intervene in other people's countries because you didn't like their religion and their internal, their internal beliefs was thrown out of the window. And suddenly, I'd, almost immediately after those celebrations were over, uh, we now move into a new era where the, all the lessons of the Peace of Westphalia are being thrown out of the window. And we're, we're now justifying intervention in other people's countries without apparently any knowledge of history. It's not to do with arms sales. It's not to do with naval bases. It's to do with that principle of sovereignty. Yes. Uh, Sorry. Yes. What's your please. position on boycotting the X Games in Russia? Uh, sir? What's your position on boycotting the X Games in Russia? I don't really believe in boycotting games. I'm not terribly interested in, 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 in games or sports myself, but I don't, I don't really believe that it achieves anything very much. And the boycott, the, the partial boycott of the, of the Olympics in Soviet times didn't actually achieve a withdrawal of the Soviet Union from Afghanistan. <coughs> uh, it's gesture politics. If anybody individually, as a matter of conscience, wishes to boycott anything, as far as I'm concerned, they should be supported. Any, any act of conscience should be, should be supported and sympathised with. But for government uh, to make boycott seems to me to be a, 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 almost a direct contradiction of that. You can't have a, a, a government-sponsored conscience. Your conscience has to be your own. So individual, individuals who feel that it's something they don't want to do, quite right. And, 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 that's, and that's their decision. But governments doing it, I think, is, 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 is largely... Futile grandstanding and, and, and of no value. Um, the question would be: um, What is your take on the hypothetical situation? If, let's say tomorrow the government of the United States says that they need to go and protect their citizens in Syria, however many uh, of those that might be there, and uh, see that as a reason for intervention. And if, I mean, the reason I'm asking really is a reference to 2008 Georgian War, really. A reference to the. Uh, 2008 Georgian War, where the Russian the Georgian War, yes, it's very interesting. Georgian War. Um, I think it's possible. Um, this is again, this is, this is another very important question here. Most people think that the Nuremberg trials of the, of the German National Socialist leaders were about the massacre of the Jews. Uh, to, some, to some extent, they were. The principle that those trials were, were intended to establish was that it was no longer possible under international law for anybody to wage aggressive war. And that was the principal crime for which they were indicted, and that was the principal change in international law which resulted from it. So the, the, and the, the main <coughs> effect of this has been to restrict the right to wage aggressive war to the great powers, which have one way or another been able to, to ignore or circumvent United Nations rules. You could find a way, I expect, to circumvent those rules. But I think that the, in fact, the chemical weapons allegations, still, in my view, not fully examined, let alone proven, against the Syrian government of Damascus, were an attempt to circumvent them. But I think that they, they so lacked popular support in the United States, and indeed congressional support, uh, that, and, and so failed to convince that I think another pretext of that kind probably wouldn't work either. Uh, the Georgian War is, is, is interesting because of the very strange American 
and European Union presence in the Caucasus, where they have no historic ties or, or business being, and where anybody who has any sense who lives there knows they won't sustain themselves. It's just, it's as if uh, Vladimir Putin started, uh, as the Soviet Union used to do, uh, setting up and influencing governments in <coughs> Central and Latin America, uh, and trying to, um, tr try to, try to set up uh, cordons of allies along the borders of the United States. It's, it's, it's actually quite provocative diplomatic activity. But in a way, Vladimir Putin, being the champion of uh, sovereignty, um, did in, uh, invade uh, Georgia on, on the basis that um, there was this internal um, problem in Georgia going on, and Russia said uh, openly, publicly, that it felt it needed to go there in order to protect their citizens. Which you could argue is an intervention. My understanding is that Saakashvili uh, initiated the military action on that occasion, and it may, <coughs> may have been a very useful pretext to the Russians, but they, and they did enter Georgian territory, but they didn't remain uh, on, 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 on Georgian territory. And there are all kinds of disputes there about, uh, about uh, Ossetia, in particular, and Abkhazia, uh, which are more complicated than I think anybody this evening wants to get into. It's the Schleswig Holstein territory, but they are. Um, the fact is that the Russian forces entered Georgia and then left uh, and have not made any effort to, uh, to return to Georgia since then, uh, even though it's the view, I think, of almost every uh, serious Russian diplomat and politician that <coughs> countries in the Caucasus, as well as Ukraine, Belarus, uh, will eventually return in some form to the Moscow orbit, and I think they're probably right. They, they're not going to do it with military force. Anyone else? Yes, please. Um, do you believe we'll see any Russian intervention if the US was to attack Iran? <sighs> who knows? I really don't think. Uh, I, I'm one of those people who doesn't believe that Iran has a serious intention of constructing nuclear weapons. And I'm also one of those who, who is tempted very strongly to believe that the new Iranian president is actually pretty much what he appears to be. But Iran has, since Britain and Russia uh, used to more or less partition Persia, uh, has been a Russian sphere of influence uh, for the obvious reason that it's, that it's on the southern borders of, 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 of the Russian Empire. And if there were any American intervention there, I can't see Russia standing back. But I think the idea of an American intervention, a direct American military inter intervention in, in Iran, is probably at the moment more distant than it has been for some time. I certainly hope so. And one of the reasons for that is precisely that it could trigger a much more serious conflict well beyond the borders of Iran. And the, the fact that uh, there are other powers who would be interested in that and would object to it, I think, is one of the reasons why a diplomatic solution is more likely. What if Israel was to... I think Israel will do what the Americans let Israel do. I think, I think an Israeli government that acted independently of the United States in, in Iran would not last very long. I don't think the Americans would permit it, and I think that the pressure which the United States has placed upon Israel diplomatically and indeed financially is so huge that I would be amazed uh, if, even if, I know <coughs> Mr. Netanyahu is noisy on the subject, but I think I would be amazed if he took unilateral action against Iran. Yes, please. Is Putin's decision to issue Edward Snowden with a visa and not counterintuitive to what you were saying about interfering with the US's business? I think um, it's, not a, it's not a direct interference with, with, the, with, the, um, with the internal affairs of the United States. It's a hostile act, uh, no question of that. And, but I think that he would probably, if, if you had him here, say that it, it was quite minor compared with the many hostile acts which he believes the United States had taken against Russia. Uh, it's, not a, 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 it's not an aggression onto American territory, uh, and uh, it's, it, it, it's, 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 you might call it passive aggressive, uh, rather than anything else. I, 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 don't, I don't think it really qualifies as a cause of power. Yes, please. Um, I can see, I can kind of see the view of you don't want intervention in other countries. However, that wouldn't make me like Vladimir Putin because of all of the wrongs that he's done, like you said. Um, and it seems to me that you can agree with his view of not intervening, but I don't think it's fair to say he's doing it because he wants peace in the world. 
I really think he is partially for selfish reasons. He doesn't want intervention in other countries because he thinks that it will lead to intervention in Russia and what best spot for intervention in their own country. Um, well, I agree with you about selfish reasons, uh, completely. I think that you, with selfish motives are the only ones you can rely on, especially with, with powerful nations. Uh, that is, uh, I think it was Palmerston who, who said that, that countries don't have eternal friendships, they have eternal interests. And they will act selfishly, unless they're, they're governed by irrational idiots who act selflessly, which usually leads countries into all kinds of disasters. Um, so no, I don't, it's, I don't in any way accuse him of, of idealism, uh, which is something I deplore anyway. Uh, idealism is, usually ends in disaster. The, the utopia can only ever be approached across a sea of blood, and you never arrive. So the less idealist policies we are, the, the happier the world will generally be. So no, that's not a question of... of I, I think if, if his policies are followed, I think there will be more peace and less war. We wouldn't have had the Libyan war. We would not now have. I mean, two other consequences of that. We would not now have a, a, a state so failed that its only prime minister can be kidnapped in the streets of his own capital. And if he'd been kidnapped in Benghazi, I don't think he'd been released. Uh, and one of the other consequences, though, of course, is, is this tragic, uh, uncontrolled mass immigration across the Mediterranean, which uh, the Gaddafi regime, for all its many failings, was controlling and, and preventing, which does no good to any of the people taking part in it, let alone to the countries uh, where those people arrived. So, a, a bit of cynicism, a bit of selfishness in, 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 in foreign policy is not a bad thing. Uh, generally, it's much more likely to have benevolent results for ordinary people trying to live lives, raise families, and, and do their jobs uh, than utopianism, idealism, and what Robin Cook used to call ethical foreign policy. Uh, yes, please, back. Okay, do you have an opinion on um, Putin's pursuit of the war in Chechnya and the vast uh, human rights abuses and disappearances that Russian forces were accused of that? Oh, I think the Russian, I think the Russian armed forces are absolutely horrible um, in their, um, and savage in their, in their behavior. And uh, I think that the, the way in which they've conducted that war is, is despicable. And one feels a lot for the, for the, for the victims of it. I only say an important point here. When Boris Yeltsin, uh, who, was, who was actually in most important terms a Western patsy in the Kremlin, was pursuing a, a war just as brutal in Chechnya, if not more so, it didn't attract anything like so much criticism. So when this criticism arises, you have to say, is it really about the war in Chechnya, or is it really about the fact that we don't... Or, the U.S. State Department, the British Foreign Office, and the KPLC don't like the actions of Lenin and Putin. I think because they were more or less silent about Yeltsin's Chechen war, uh, that it's because they don't like Lenin and Putin. They couldn't care less about what goes on in Chechen, and, 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 uh, and they're, they're making it up. But that's just my own opinion. Would it not be better because uh, Yeltsin lost the war, so there's no to criticize him? Well, I, maybe. I mean, I, 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 I think fundamentally the, the method that he, he lost it with this, roughly the same methods that, that, that Putin is, used to win it. I suppose um, Putin was more competent, competently brutal than Yeltsin, but that's not really a moral question, is it? Yes, please. Is there ever a line with intervention that you think can be crossed and intervention is justified? And if not, what is the role of the UN? Uh, for me, I'm against it completely. Uh, I just, I, I just think that on, on principle, I think uh, countries should run themselves, and they should be allowed to run themselves. I know there are examples: uh, the Vietnamese intervention in Cambodia, the Ugandan intervention, um, the, the um, Tanzanian, I think, intervention in Idi Amin's Uganda, <coughs> and possibly Sierra Leone. Though that's not over yet, where you can make a case and say that it, it, it was. Uh, it was benevolent in its, in its effect. Uh, I know that you could say that in Rwanda, if an intervention happened, maybe people would have been saved. That I've never seen a, a practical uh, plan put forward for how that intervention would have happened. Uh, I'm just, I just have to put up with that. Uh, that, that it's possible that sometimes, by failing to intervene, several things would happen which are avoidable. I think that the, the principle of leaving people to get on with their own affairs inside their sovereign borders is so important that you that you might have to sometimes to stand by and let horrible things happen. Uh, whether there is such a thing as international law, I'm not sure. Uh, 
There's a very interesting book by Michael John Lachlan about, uh, about the political trial, starting with the trial of Charles I in England, moving on to that of Louis XVI in France, and tracing a, a line of these trials through to the modern, uh, the modern international court trials. And there is something very suspect about it. I do recommend it. It's a fascinating book. Because, and it, it tells you lots of things which you thought you knew and don't. And my feeling has been for a long time that if despots... Uh, knew that they could escape with their with their money uh, to Saudi Arabia or Switzerland or San Bolto, they would be much more likely to leave power than if they thought that they would end their days in a cell in, in the Hague, or as Charles Taylor is apparently going to do, somewhere perhaps in, in, in Belmarsh. I, they won't go if they think that they will be they will be imprisoned. They will go if they think that they won't be in prison. And I think it's, it's, it's the law of unintended consequences at full stretch. The current fashion for locking up despots actually makes despots hang on to power much more grimly than they otherwise would. So, Russia is the protecting Russia through non interference because they want no intervention in their country. Mm -hmm. But what makes Putin do that? Because of what is he fighting? Like, who should intervene in Russia? <coughs> is he saying Russia is not fighting in any other state anymore? Uh, what well, I think, I think a lot of people uh, look at what happened in the, in the supposed Orange Revolution in Ukraine. And look at what happened in the supposed Rose Revolution in Georgia, just, just as examples. And ask yourself how it is that so many people found themselves equipped with orange flags and orange jackets and so forth in, in Kiev, and, and how there came to be a rose revolution in, uh, in, in Tbilisi. And wonder to yourself whether anybody outside Kiev and Tbilisi might possibly be involved, whether anyone had any, any interest in that. What Putin undoubtedly feared, and that's why he set up the rather grotesque movement called Nashi, which you doubtless aware of. Uh, what Putin undoubtedly fears is that somebody, some open society organization, NGO or whatever it's called, will foment some sort of white ribbon revolution of the kind which seemed to be taking off in Moscow in February of 2012. And if that could be done, <coughs> and if the crowds could be got on the streets of Moscow in sufficient numbers, and and got sufficient coverage from the Western League, he could be overthrown, it's perfectly possible, by perhaps a, a renewed Yeltsinist regime, because a lot of people outside Russia benefited a great deal from the Yeltsin regime, which pretty much let them plunder the place. I said I've mentioned Stanislav Gavrikin again, because during the, the 2012 election campaign, I noticed that he was taking part in it. He was this man, who this, this friend of Solzhenitsyn, this foe of the Soviet regime, and of and of, of, of corruption and oppression, actively campaigning for Vladimir Putin. And do you know what he said? He said, under Yeltsin, this country was sold. It was sold to foreigners, sold to corrupt people. The corruption was completely outrageous. Under Putin, we have returned to normal corruption. Uh, and that, for anybody who knows anything about Russia, is, 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 a, is an easily comprehensible statement, one which, and one which is absolutely true. Corruption is normal in that country, and the, at the levels it was at under Yeltsin, and the level of plundering, particularly by, by foreign investors of the country under Yeltsin, was huge. And I think there are a lot of people outside Russia who would like that plundering to begin again, and I think Putin stands against them. I think that's, uh, that, that is the fundamental reason why he feels <coughs> under threat. Which raises the question of Alexei Navalny, who is lionized and made much of, I noticed by writers in the Guardian newspaper, if they read carefully <laughs> Navalny's thoughts on the people of the Caucasus and his description of them as cockroaches and his talk about shooting people, then I think they would be less enthusiastic, but they blind themselves to the nature of Alexei Navalny because they're so completely disposed to be against the Putin government that they, they will not see any faults in his opponents. And this is, again, it's just this thing. If you, if you were really, really, really a, a, a democratic person who believed in the rule of law and a liberal society, <coughs> you wouldn't like any of the players in modern Russian politics. None of them is actually significantly better than Putin on those terms. And, it's, and, and you simply can't overthrow Putin on the basis that once he's gone, he'll be replaced by a, 
Russian equivalent of, shall we say, Barack Obama, because no such equivalent exists. Uh, yes, please. Um, I don't quite understand how you can be against um, taking national sovereignty from the country and be supporting Russia when are they not trying to prize the economic and political sovereignty from their neighbours? Um, there is a, there is the question. I, I, the tr one of the troubles with, with with liking Russia is that you become, <coughs> as I have, a, um, as much as I'm a British patriot, something of a great Russian chauvinist. I don't myself believe that the borders uh, into which Russia was forced uh, at the end of the Cold War were just borders, or correct borders, or sustainable borders. I think that there was. A, there was, almost all Russians believe that the, the deal which Gorbachev struck with the West was that the Soviet Union would be broken up, the Soviet domination of Eastern Europe would end, the Soviet attempt to counter United States powers as, as an ideological world <coughs> would come to an end, but the, the country, which was then the USSR, would remain largely as it had been. And then I remember James Baker coming it, it, it very, very triumphantly to Moscow late during my, my time there, and more or less announcing that, that, that Russia was going to have to, have to have to lose its power over what Russians term the near abroad. And there's been a very aggressive move by the European Union and by the United States into the Caucasus and into Ukraine. Uh, less so in Belarus, which is a more complicated case. And many Russians believe that they've simply, that, that what's happened is, is, is quite similar to what happened to their country in 1917 under the almost Carthaginian peace of brest litovsk imposed by Imperial Germany after, uh, after the, the um, German high commanders sent Lenin uh, to Petrograd to overthrow the, the government. And they believe that those borders are unjust and unsustainable, and they, they don't regard these, these neighboring countries as as foreign countries, they regard them really as part of their own sphere of influence, and they will eventually uh, restore that. I think they will. I think the, 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 the force of nature uh, will, will, will restore Russian domination over those areas. There's a huge tussle going on over Ukraine at the moment, and I think it will, be, in the short term, it will tend towards the European Union, but in the long term, Ukraine will, will end up in the Russian sphere of influence again, simply because that is the way it's bound to be. But the, if you look, it, it's the, the great unexamined treaty of modern times of the brest treaty of 1917, uh, you will see in it the foreshadowing of, uh, of, the, of the humiliation of 1990 and, 19, and 1991. And Stalin's Russia uh, reversed brest uh, Putin's Russia, I think, will reverse, the, um, will reverse what happened in 1991. Uh, yes, please. Hi, um, you talked a little bit about how you... Uh, about um, ideas and ideas, ideas, or ideology. Um, how are you distinguishing between that and principle? Um, principle is, is, a, is, is, I think, a form of absolute morality. Some <laughs> things are always wrong, some things are always right, and your actions should be guided insofar as it's humanly possible by that. <coughs> Idealism, I would say, would be the, the belief that there is um, that's, that human society is in some way perfectible, uh, either in terms of you know, international politics or domestic politics, uh, that there is a, a utopian model, uh, say, of world government, a la Star Trek, uh, or, um, or of um, a, an egalitarian society domestically, which, uh, which can be and ought to be pursued and is preferable to pragmatic, take it as it comes, uh, limited amelioration sorts of, uh, sorts of politics. I think that's the distinction. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think so. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I go further back? Okay. Uh, do you think it's possible for Russia to move on from its more like autocratic past to a more democratic, <coughs> and democratic uh, structure? I'm, I'm not all that in favour of democracy anywhere, anyway. Um, but uh, it seems to be a very dodgy idea and, and, and hasn't proved to be very successful where it's been tried. But in, in, liberty and, and law seem to me to be the most. In fact, this is an interesting point. 
when the Soviet regime collapsed, uh, people rushed into Moscow and said, you must have democracy, and you must have a free market. And two results of this, uh, one, the economy collapsed. The other, um, there is a, I have to be slightly rude here, um, the many, many Russians now don't say democratia when they refer to democracy. Uh, they use a slightly different word, dermoka, dermokratia, which means, uh, and I won't be as profane as it is, in, in, it means the rule of excrement. Uh, and that is how democracy, so-called, is regarded by many, many Russians. The era in which they were at their most democratic was an era of plunder, corruption, gangsterism, people being forced out of their homes, losing their jobs, the, de the debauching of their currency. Uh, everything awful uh, is associated in their minds with it. So I think the chances of that in the near future are pretty slender. The other problem about Russia is where it is. Uh, I think this is true, and I've checked it with Russian friends. I don't claim to be a brilliant Russian linguist, but you will probably have heard of the KGB, uh, the initial stand for Komitet Gasudast the third word, Vyazapazmosti, meaning security, but um, it is actually it's, it's not a proper word. Vyaz means without, a pasmos means danger. The word for security in Russia is not a positive word, it's an absence of danger. And the reason for that is not hard to see. The, the country has no really defensible physical borders, uh, which is why for most of its existence it's been an army with the country rather than the other way around. Uh, for instance, there is a street in Moscow uh, called uh, Balsha Ordinka. It's where the Israeli embassy used to be, <coughs> so is, which translates as the street of the Great Horde. It is where the Golden Horde used to turn up every five years to collect their tribute. It's a frontier country, it's a frontier city, it's a frontier culture, and it's very much on the edges of Europe and of civilization, always under threat from one thing or another, within living memory, horribly invaded uh, by, the, by, the, by the Germans. It's that, on that insecurity, I think the enormous power of the Russian state, uh, the willingness to accept levels of, of, of repression which we would find intolerable, rests. And until you can resolve that, I don't think it's very likely that it's ever going to be governed in, in the ways, say, that, um, that Britain or the United States can. Uh, you tend to find that stable, free, law-governed societies are, are surrounded by water uh, or protected from their neighbours by high mountains or deserts. Uh, they, they're not in the position that Russia is in, a, a sort of corridor for, for invaders. And I think, I, I doubt it. I would like it to be so. A lot of Russians I know would love it to be so. Uh, but it, it, there is a, a great and very, uh, a very notable civilization there, particularly a literary one, but I, I just don't see it as, as, as likely in the near future. Please. Do you think you uh, like Putin more with regard to his international policy than his domestic policy? Yes. I think quite simply, that's what mostly concerns me. I don't, uh, the, the internal policy <coughs> of Russia are, by definition, in my argument, Russia's business, not mine. So it is an interesting fact uh, that it, although it's undoubtedly true that, that any serious political opposition to Putin is, is ruthlessly crushed, it's probably easier uh, to say, uh, to speak your mind as an individual uh, in modern Russia than it is in modern Britain, particularly if you work in, in the public sector of modern Britain, where if you, if you transgress various rules of equality and diversity in conversation, in a state school or in a, in a, in a state-run hospital or in, in a local authority, you're quite likely to lose your job. I don't think that happens in Russia. It's a very interesting paradox uh, and, uh, and one which I think people should think about quite hard. But no, I, it's, I, mean, I, 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 loved, I, I I'd love to see the, the uh, renaissance of Moscow after the death of communism. I think it's probably the, the, the city in Europe that I most enjoy being in, but it, it has horrible aspects to it which I think are, 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 are indefensible and I don't defend them. But in terms of foreign policy, I think it makes a very important uh, contribution to the peace of the world. Yes, please. Um, do you think that the Russian foreign policy is moving in the right direction in terms of achieving greater influence in world politics? And is the creation of the Eurasian Custom Union and the SCO the right steps taken in that direction, counterbalancing the Western influence in world affairs? 
Um, I think there was a very, very large Russian <coughs> foreign policy success over the, the, the attempt to start war in Syria. And I think that the, the performance of Sergei Lavrov as a foreign minister uh, was a demonstration to the world of what genuinely informed, historically informed, and, and, and serious-minded diplomacy uh, can achieve uh, in a difficult time. I think if Lavrov hadn't been involved, uh, quite possibly we would have had a Western intervention in Syria with all the horrible consequences that would have followed. I don't know about the, about, about the, the, the Eurasian um, business. I think that there is, there is a huge realignment coming. You only need to look at this extraordinary thing. You go to the Russian Far East, and on one side of the Asuri River are dying Russian cities where the birth rate is, 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 is lower than the death rate and the, the buildings are empty and the, the, the factories are piled with rust. And on the other side of the same river are huge, growing Chinese cities expanding by about a square mile a week full of people. And how much longer uh, China is going to be prepared to tolerate Russian occupation of territory taken from it in the past when it was weaker, which Russia isn't even doing anything with, I don't know. The, the future relations between Russia and China are one of the big, unexamined, uh, diplomatic perils of our time, but I, I, I really don't know uh, how that's going to go. I hope, I hope, as I think everybody must, that whatever happens, it's peaceful. Yes, please. Um, returning to an earlier point, you could then use foreign intervention and sanctions against despots, but yes. in the absence of both, how do you, does one move violently oppressive governments from power, or at least curtail their action? One does. Yes. Well, here we we touch on a delicate subject, but the Second World War was not actually fought by those countries which began it, or indeed by those countries which finished it, because they had any objections uh, to the internal government of, of Nazi Germany. Uh, it's one of the great myths of modern times that the Second World War was an idealistic war. Uh, it was nothing of the kind. Uh, this is, there's a whole evening we could spend on discussing this. But one of the, the problems of this great myth, which is, is, is constantly raised, is that, for, take for instance, the Second Iraq War. George W. <coughs> Bush and Anthony Blair imagined themselves to be reborn Winston Churchill. They portrayed Saddam Hussein as, as a new Hitler and uh, Iraq's Ba'ath Party as, a, as equivalent to the German National Socialist Party. We know that perfectly well, of course, that neither, neither Mr. Blair nor Mr. Bush was a reborn <coughs> Winston Churchill. Uh, I don't know quite who in, the, in past history they could be equated with, but certainly not him. Uh, but uh, and I think any sensible person also knows that Saddam Hussein was not really Hitler. But this pattern repeatedly imposed on every international crisis. Anthony even did the same thing during the Suez madness. He claimed that, that NASA was a, was a dictator of Hitler. It's all based upon a, a myth about the Second World War. We did not fight, I and mean, you might argue that we should have done, but we did not fight against the, the nature of the, the National Socialist regime. Uh, when the truth about the mass murder of Europe's Jews was brought to the attention of the British Foreign Office and the American State Department, they ignored it and did nothing. Uh, the uh, principal ally in the eventual defeat of German National Socialism was Stalin, who, if not as bad as Hitler, was so nearly as bad that any claim that the Allied side in the Second World War had any moral character seems to me to melt away. It's a myth. That's not what happened. If internally bad regimes are the concerns of their own people. If they want to get rid of them, they can get rid of them themselves. And if they don't, then they don't. But it's not our business to intervene. Sorry, it's your turn now. Yeah, considering Russia's very sovereign and national view, do you think it's a place for Russia or indeed anybody at all on the UN Security Council? Well, I'm very glad that Russia and and China on the US Security Council at the moment, uh, because it, it, the, the structure of it has, means that they've been able to prevent <coughs> foolish things from happening. I think it's one of those ways <coughs> where, uh, as W.H. Orden said in a different circumstance, why spit on your luck? It might not be the arrangement that I would have designed, or anybody would design, but it, it worked out well for the world in general, that there's somebody capable of, of restraining David Cameron when he goes parking that. 
uh, and on that occasion it was it was it was Russia. So I I, I, I can't really complain about it. I, I wouldn't myself if, if if I were left to design the world myself. It wouldn't include anything called the United Nations, but it's there, and on that occasion it performed a useful function. So I'm not going to criticize it. Yes. Going back to the question before. If you were in charge at the time, would you have let the extermination go on? At which yes time? Or no, at the time of the Second World War. So well, you I guess you, this, this why it takes a whole other evening. <coughs> the, the policy of the Hitler government towards the Jews of Germany uh, was between 1933 and 1938 uh, largely one of appalling persecution insulting behaviour, deprivation of privileges and, and, and all kinds of other revolting things, but it was not ex extermination, uh, nor was it openly, generally murderous, particularly on the part of the state. Um, in, after Kristallnacht in 1938, when the state sponsored the murder of large numbers of Jews, it, it switched, but the main purpose of it up to that point was actually the expulsion of Jews from Germany, not their extermination. The, the policy of extermination was not conceived of, nor did it begin, until after the Second World War had been in progress for more than two years. Uh, whether there is an argument, which I'm not even qualified to have, I'm not prepared to have this evening, whether it happened because of the war, whether it happened because the war gave Hitler the chance to hide what he was doing that he wouldn't otherwise be able to do, I don't know. But it is certainly the case that it is difficult to conceive of how he could have embarked on that policy uh, if there hadn't been a war. And it's also the case that the kindertransporten of Jewish children leaving German territory, uh, <coughs> and which saved many, many valuable lives and was one of the most effective ways of rescuing Jews from the Nazis, uh, ended the moment Britain and France declared war in September 1939. And Many people died as a result. And secondly, the conduct of the war by Britain and France, incompetent and, uh, as it was uh, between September 1939 and May 1940, led to the occupation by Hitler of almost all of continental Western Europe and the, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Jews who fled from Hitler uh, or who were living in those countries and would not have feared him otherwise. So there is a question here as to whether the extermination of Europe's Jews uh, was... Uh, was, 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 there's no question it wasn't actually taking place before the war began. There's no question that when the chancellors of, of the Allies discovered it was going on, they did nothing about it. Uh, there is a question as to whether it can, be, it can be said that it was the cause of it, but it's much, much more complicated than Hitler was exterminating the Jews should we have intervened to stop it. Uh, that's all. It, it's, not a, it's not a question that can be given a direct answer to. But, it, it is the case that the one exception in, in, in the United Nations Charter, the one overriding exception of the rule against intervening other people's countries, is actual genocide, uh, a word which I think is quite often misused in modern times and applied to things which, which aren't actually genocide. Do you agree with that? Because if you don't think we should... I don't know. I mean, I, I, in, in theory, I agree with it. In practice, I, in practice, the way in which it's used makes me suspicious of it because it, there's, there's this... But then... The, the, then there is this tremendous struggle to label as genocide things which plainly aren't the equivalents of the mass murder of the Jews, uh, and therefore to use it as a pretext. If it's, if, I don't know whether anybody will ever attempt to do again what Hitler attempted to do uh, in the final solution. Um, but I do know that, it, it, that, that false parallels are made with it an, an awful lot of the, of the time uh, as, as pretexts for war. And I also know that although no one, I yield to no one in my horror at the, at the, at the, the deaths resulting from Hitler's policies, but one must also examine the hideous deaths of millions of people as a result of the war uh, that, that was fought. No one actually knows how many people died in the Second World War, particularly in, in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, what they do know in many cases is, is that how they died was appalling and unpleasant, and very few people in this room probably know, uh, though there is a, now a fine book on the subject with the title Orderly and Humane. I can't remember the name of the author, but Orderly and Humane will bring it up for you. 
about the Potsdam Agreement and the mass expulsions of German women and children from the lands of the East after the war, in which untold numbers of people died hideous deaths, uh, when we had guaranteed that no such thing would happen. So the, the horror of war during and after is immense. And if you're going to start one, you have to recognize that you might be responsible for that. And your, your pretext for war might turn out to be smaller than the, the horrible consequences which would cause it. It's worth thinking about. It's, it's not a balance that any, any sane person can weigh. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's much, much more complicated than something bad's going on. We can intervene. Intervention itself is tremendously complicated and by no means invariably successful. Please. Yes. I think for the argument so far, you made a clear distinction between internal and external policies of the state. In reality, do you think that distinction truly exists? Because I think a state which has no regard for human life within its own borders is not likely to drop out of the border. And I think as an international community or collection of states, we do have an interest in the attitudes and approach of governments towards their own populations because they do have a propensity, and I think the German experience you referred to is instructive in this regard, the aggression of Germany towards other nations and the policies that are adopted internally aren't really distinguishable. They were part and parcel of the same approach. Oh, I, I would disagree with that. Uh, and I'd ask you to give me an example. I mean, you say countries have no concern for the, for the lives of anybody in their borders. So where will you be thinking of? My, my, I, I suppose my argument is you've said that you're against intervention yes, in, in any circumstance. <coughs> yeah, though I, I recognise that this puts me at a disadvantage in certain... In the, I yeah, recognise that this, this devours me. And so I'm very country. tempted to take that out of the battle. Yes. Certainly, yeah. My argument is that do you not think there are certain actions within the borders of a state that may be pursued by that government which go beyond setting its own laws on social policies or taxation and actually go to the, the core of um, what it means to, to live as a human being in the world? I'm not talking about this in any kind of idealistic international humanitarian sense. What I'm saying is, by definition, certain um, types of government are a threat to, to other states because of how they act internally? Well, first of all, there is the problem of consistency. And if you wanted to look in the past century for examples of countries in which horrible things have happened, uh, in many cases denied and unimportant at the time, one could go to the, uh, the post-revolutionary Russian Civil War, uh, you could go to the massacre of Armenians by the Turks, uh, you could go to the appalling man-made famines and other massacres of Mao Zedong's China. Uh, now, some very fine work being done by Michael Ertke about the murderous nature of the, of the Maoist regime from the very beginning. Uh, the, these are all examples of, of, of terrible things which went on while the world stood back and did nothing uh, for the simple reason that either it, it didn't know, I, I didn't mention there are the Ukrainian family in, in um, largely Ukrainian families in, uh, in Russia in, 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 in the early 30s, which we didn't know about. I, either we didn't know or we weren't uh, prepared to intervene in them because we were too weak to do so. Uh, and then there's the other point, which I strove to make earlier, which is that many of these terrible things in fact, probably most of them actually happen during wars or as a direct consequence of wars. And that wars themselves create conditions in which, in which horrible massacres and repressions, uh, the, the, the driving of people from their homes in, in starvation conditions and, and therefore their mass deaths happen because of wars. And therefore, to use war as an instrument of policy against let's call it for shorthand purposes, genocide, uh, maybe simply using mass death as a cure for mass death. So I, I hesitate. I mean, it's, it is difficult, and that's the whole point of, my, of discussing it. It's, it's worth discussing, because if it was simple, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't need to be discussed. I just think that the, the, 
from what I've seen of the history of the past hundred years, uh, it seems to me that the argument repeatedly made in modern times uh, that intervention is simple, easy, and good is false and misleading, and has led to a great deal of, 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 of bad things which could have been avoided by not intervening. Yes, please. Yeah. So so far we've we've been really talking about Could you shout it? We've been talking about humanitarian intervention, right? You yeah. believe states have Well so called humanitarian. Yeah, so called humanitarian. You believe states have the right to protect themselves? Yes. yes. What if this transnational terrorism? Do we still have the right to protect ourselves? Uh, give me an example of what you mean. Well say terrorists come from Saudi Arabia, do they have the right to go there? <laughs> oh dear. Well, I haven't noticed, I mean, it, it, it is an interesting thought as to where, where terror comes from. I haven't noticed any attempts to invade, invade or bomb Saudi Arabia lately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a, um, what can I say? I, you, you, tempt, you tempt me again into territory I'd rather steer clear of, but I, I, think, I, I think that people will uh, use terrorism in other people's countries as a pretext for intervening in countries they want to intervene in anyway. But they won't intervene in countries they won't, they don't want to intervene in, or dare intervene in. So I think it's it, it, the, 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 the great task is penetrating the disguises in which history advances itself. Is this the real reason, or is it a pretext? And I think the answer is, on <coughs> so many occasions, it's a pretext. And, and terrorism is probably the biggest pretext for doing bad things in the modern world. <coughs> yes, please. Uh, you outlined your sort of moral disgust with the uh, Soviet Union at the start of the talk. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't that, if we sort of followed your rules about sort of no intervention or, I'm not really sure quite what you mean, I mean, I'm thinking maybe there could be, there were forms of pressure which helped bring the Soviet Union down. I think Reagan was in fact in the Cold War, and so certain things America did in terms of foreign policy to pressure us, so wouldn't it still be around if we sort of followed your doctrine? I was... I certainly am now, and, and looking back, I like to think that I was always more concerned about free countries recognizing the dangers of, of revolutionary idealism. Uh, the real problem with the Soviet Union was that it, 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 it had various reasons. Again, following war, largely, it, 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 it had chosen the path of revolutionary idealism. Many of the original Bolsheviks were extremely nice, charming, gentle people, uh, filled with love and brotherhood towards their fellow man, but they ended up slaughtering their fellow man and crowding him into concentration camps uh, because of the remorseless logic of their creed. And I think that was the great warning. As for bringing down the Soviet Union, I, I often regret uh, that it happened. Uh, I think that the, certainly the, the position of this country much deteriorated since the end of the Cold War. Uh, our, our, our position in Europe is much weaker and much more vulnerable to pressure from the European Union. Uh, the American alliance is much less important and protects us much less. If, if the Cold War was still going on, for instance, the United States government would never have backed the provisional IRA against the British government, as, they, uh, as, as in the end they did. That would not have happened. So, um, <coughs> and also there are for anybody who knew the Soviet system and sees what has happened, particularly to certain parts, the poorer parts of the, of the population, and indeed the, the professional middle classes in, in, in Moscow, uh, in many cases their lives have grown significantly worse as a result of the, of, of the bandit capitalism uh, which, which replaced the former system. So the fact that the former system had many things wrong with it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that what's replaced it isn't, is necessarily um, any better or more desirable. And it's another illustration of the complexity of, of intervention. Uh, the, our, our fundamental attitude towards the Soviet Union, if we believe in some of these, it's a warning, don't go down this road. Uh, it's a warning that we should prevent this, this genuinely empire from dominating Western Europe as it dominates Eastern Europe. And we should do that by force and diplomacy. Uh, and that's what I believe we should do. But, any belief in actually intervening in the Soviet Union to overthrow the Soviet government would, I think, have been folly. And I think that in, in many ways the collapse of the Soviet government has been quite bad news for a lot of the, for a lot of the Western countries, notably our own.
yes, please. Do you think there should be international aid? Or should countries, I guess, just look after their own, well, say, like Syria or like the Philippines that just had an earthquake or should walk after it? Oh, no, I think it, I think international aid is is, is is entirely justified. I think one has to be very careful how how it's spent and who spends it and who gets their hands on it. Uh, it's, it can actually do harm. Uh, you'll know about the work of, of Peter Bauer on, on, on this. The, the, his characterization of a lot of aid is the 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 poor of the West being taxed to give to the rich of the third world, and that is often the case. So aid properly targeted. Uh, is excellent and not and, and, and good, but but aid must be very carefully targeted. And it also, <coughs> in so far as possible, it should be kept out of the hands of the local government, uh, which will often misuse it, um, sometimes in quite spectacularly evil ways. But no, it's it's a different question. Sending aid to people when they've they've been the victims <coughs> of floods, earthquakes, or famines uh, is quite different from sending an army. Uh, yes. Do you think it's right for a state to act to preserve its um, own uh, national sovereignty, but in doing so, infringes on another's national sovereignty? So, for example, around Syria, there are a lot of states that <coughs> may be destabilised by the last massacre of flows of refugees and terrorism and weapons. And what are you suggesting? So, so you're saying that, that the state, the state may infringe on another's <coughs> sovereignty or preserve its own. Not a bit of a risky, I think. I guess it has a bit of a shadow of the pretext to me. What guarantee would there be that if, say, um, Israel intervened in Syria, uh, to me a, a terrifying prospect actually, but if, if that were to happen, if that Syria would be stabilised? I think probably the main result would be to unite the government and the opposition against the Israeli invaders. But, um, but I'm not quite sure who else. Turkey has, in my view, intervened quite substantially in Syria and done itself quite considerable harm by doing so. And uh, probably the, the worst mistake that the Erdogan government has, uh, has, has, has yet made, and it's rebounding quite badly on the equivalents of the Alawites in Syria, the Alevi in Turkey, and now are quite worried about their position there. So I, it, dangerous, and it, it has to sound with a pretext. I, I, I think it's better to let things work themselves out. It was the, the, the belief of the German military theorists of the 19th century that the only, uh, the only mercy in war is a swift victory. And I'm not entirely sure they were wrong. I think the best thing that can happen once the war has started is for it to come to an end as quickly as possible with a, with a sustainable resolution of the conflict which began it. And intervention on the outside tends to prolong rather than short the war. Yes, please. Um, do you not think that um, the UK government should think about um, the conditions of other countries and like what's happening domestically there when constructing a trade policy with them <coughs> and what are your thoughts on like sanctions against other countries in order, in order to effect change rather than intervention? Well, I, I tend to be against sanctions because they usually have their greatest impact on the poorest people in the country that's targeted. Uh, they had a disastrous effect, for instance, on the, uh, not just the poorest either, but sometimes the people who most want to be on good terms with. Government elites could always prove themselves against sanctions. But the, one of the things which we did in this, the sanctions we had on I Iraq during the long period before the first Gulf War was to destroy uh, the Iraqi middle class, uh, which had previously been extremely pro-Western, actually very pro-British. Uh, and, and a very strong restraining power uh, on many of the sort of things which happen in Iraq now. So I'm, I'm very unwilling to, to support sanctions. They, tend, they, they seem to me to be posturing by politicians who, who rarely have much consideration as to the effect they'll have. But if sanctions were imposed on this country, it wouldn't be the government or the plutocrats who would suffer. It would be you and me and, and, and the poorer people. And it, that's what always happens. I think sanctions are a very, uh, a very sneaky, uh, <coughs> sort of willing to wound, fearing to strike, uh, <coughs> way out for politicians who are being told by, 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 by newspapers or some other pressure group that something must be done, but who don't care to make war but want to make a gesture. And it, it's often more damaging, than, far more damaging than doing nothing. Were you against them in South Africa? The 80s. Were they against what? Were you against them in South Africa in the 80s? 
I couldn't make up my mind. I don't. I mean, it's it's very difficult in, in, in all these things. Um, you can be against, as I think any civilized person was, the arrangements in South Africa, uh, without necessarily uh, desiring that South Africa should head in the direction which it's now heading. Uh, which seems to me, certainly from from what I read and from what I've experienced on visits, uh, to be in in many ways quite serious for the inhabitants of that country. It, again, it's, it's the application of utopianism. Uh, something is bad, uh, but do you know that you can replace it with something better? It's, I, I don't know how many people in this room could, 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 could rewire a house or, or, or do the plumbing or, or build a wall that wouldn't fall over. And I certainly imagine that very few of our politicians is capable of, of, of even making a Lego model on a... <coughs> Uh, so why these people think they can reconstruct an entire country <coughs> at a distance of several thousand miles, uh, I really don't know. It's a big business rebuilding society, and it's very difficult to get it right. Yes, please. Um, what's your opinion on I think amnesty does an immense amount of good, uh, and provided it limits itself to its original purpose. <coughs> uh, I, I joined Amnesty many, many, many years ago, and had taken part in the letter-writing campaigns and all the other things, and I thought that its original incarnation, when you, you made sure, if you, if, you, if you wrote a letter to the Kremlin about somebody in the Gulag, you also wrote a letter to Chile about somebody in Pinochet's prisons, and it was, there was no, no the taking of sides uh, was a vital part of it, but it couldn't, couldn't be accused of, being, of, of having an alignment. I'm not so sure that that's true anymore, and I regret its, its increasing politicization. I think, for instance, its campaign against the death penalty in the United States is entirely misguided. It, whatever opinion you have on the death penalty in the United States, which is irrelevant to this, it's not to do with prisoners of conscience, and it engages in a, in a public argument which is different. So I think the, <coughs> the more they stay out of politics and the more they concentrate on doing <coughs> individual good, uh, as William Blake said, uh, the, the, the general good is the resort of the scandal. Real good is done in minute particulars. And the great thing about Amnesty was it did do real good in minute particulars. There was somebody who'd been sitting in a cell for years and years without any idea that anything ha was happening at all. And suddenly he began to receive letters from outsiders. And the people who were imprisoning him received them too. And he was often released. It worked. And I think that's fantastic. But to, to as so often, it's, it's so much easier for these organizations to become political pressure groups, grandstanding, <coughs> preaching for the supposed general good and, and forgetting the minute particulars. I think it's important they stick to those minute particulars. Uh, I think you've been before, haven't you? Uh, anyone who hasn't had a go? Well, yes, please. How uh, did the death of Lyndon Yanko affect your opinion of Putin? How did the death of Lyndon Yanko affect your opinion of Putin? Uh, badly. I, I think, I, though, I think we, we have... <laughs> still an absence of, 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 a, of a complete trail between Litvinenko and the state there, whereas the Magnitsky affair is much worse because the, the Magnitsky died under the direct control of the Russian state, and, and there's no question of that. And I think probably the, the worst single block on, on Putin has to be the Magnitsky, the Magnitsky case. And I think I would, I would, if I were... If I were giving a, a, an absolute condemnation of anything that government had done, and everything, I, whenever I write about this, I'm absolutely clear. I don't, I don't hesitate to, to, to attack all these things with, with complete virulence and say that say they're wrong. I think the Magnitsky case is, 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 is much, much more convincingly uh, pinnable on the, on, the, on the Russian state itself than the Lubinenko. What about Anna Politkovska? What about Anna Politkovska? That's again. That's again. It, it's difficult to to to, to actually to show a direct cause, though it's very suspicious. Um, you, can't, you, you, you can't, looking at the case, help but wonder whether there was, there, there was some state involvement in the murder of Bolikovskaya. But I, I don't know. Uh, that's why I say, in the case of Magnitsky, it's, it's absolutely up and shut. This is a regime which will do dreadful things. Uh, and has done, and I don't doubt they'll do again. Uh, the question is whether this blinds us to other qualities of it which are, um, are praiseworthy. Uh, yes, please. Um, in terms of your normal interventionist stance, 
What do you think about countries where it seems to be proven that they can't <coughs> get rid of their own dictators or sort themselves out like Somalia or Yeah, actually Somalia, which I had the, um, I don't know what the word is, um, which I had visited um, on the eve of an American intervention, actually. Uh, this would have been, I think, 93, just um, before Christmas, when George Bush Sr. <laughs> sent the Marines in. And I was standing on the beach when they arrived. And the, uh, the Navy SEALs were in the bushes. Uh, and when we went to talk to them, they were very rude to us because they, they thought they were invisible and they, they were embarrassing. <laughs> and then a press officer of the Marines appeared and said, will you all stand here because the invasion is going to come in there? And so we stood here and then the invasion came here and they were all shouting, get out of the way! So I'd seen an intervention in Somalia and it was a complete failure. Uh, and it was a complete failure on top of serial interventions by several Western powers in that country. Uh, which had caused the chaos uh, into which it fought. It was intervention by the West, often Cold War based, and, and by the East, uh, in Somalia, which had turned it from a, a relatively civilized country into a, into a disastrous failed state. I mean, I saw it. it, it you, you, I arrived at the airport and was, was greeted by, by a group of 14 year old boys uh, with AK 47s offering <coughs> services as bodyguards. And I turned to the man who came in with me on the plane who knew my position. I said, do I accept this offer? He said, oh, yes, you don't have any bodyguards. You'll, you'll, you'll be dead and stripped by morning. And so I hired these 14-year-olds and, and, and drove around these blasted, blasted <coughs> streets. Uh, everything, mud, puddles, rubble, ruins, uh, desolation. And when I got home, I was shown pictures of the same streets about 30 years before. Uh, with pavement cafes and uniformed policemen directing the traffic and t telephone kiosks to smart cars. And in a very, very short time, foreign intervention had turned a relatively civilized, stable, and prosperous country. And Somalis are, 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 are tremendous people. Uh, some of you who helped me there, I, I will never forget uh, the, the human qualities of them, but they. There just isn't anything there. There is no structure there. And it's because of intervention that it's like that. Whether any intervention could now succeed, I don't know. I was myself distressed uh, when the Islamic courts seemed to be ensuring <coughs> some sort of order. I didn't like the look of the Islamic courts myself. wouldn't want to live under them. But they seemed to be achieving the restoration of order in, in, in Mogadishu. And suddenly they were classified as being connected to al-Qaeda and... and, and initiatives were launched against them. So again, the, the hope of stability seemed to me to be ripped away. I may be wrong about that. I'm not an expert in Somalia. I, I just know what I've seen. And every time I read about it, I, I'm concerned about it because I have seen it. But it, intervention can, can cause chaos. And but you can't leave the chaos once it's there. You can't just well, we have. retreat and leave it. We have. When the American Marines, who are a, a fine fighting force, uh, though they, they shot at several British journalists on arrival. Uh, but they're a fine fighting force, and very brave men, military extremely competent, and they were driven out by General ID. Uh, their intervention was a complete failure, and, and everybody should read Black Hawk Down, the description of how, how it failed and what a disaster it was. Intervention, as I say, is very difficult. It's, people think it's partly it's a television problem. Television crews are constantly being airlifted in remote places, and people think, well, therefore, if you can get a television crew into and out of, Sarajevo or Damascus or Aleppo or wherever it is, then you can get an army in. <coughs> well, you can sometimes get an army in, but it might take three days to get an army in somewhere, but it might take you 30 years to get it out again. And in that time, it may have become the target of the people you went there to save, as it very often happens. Look at the, the, the trip <coughs> which Harold Wilson sent into Belfast and London in 1969, uh, who was still there 30 years later and have become the enemies of the people they've come to help. Intervention is complicated. It's not, you can't just press a button and intervene and make things good. Do you think that um, Putin deserves a Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, given some of the people who've had it, it would be hard to say who's necessarily ruled out, but I'm not on the committee. I mean, it's a satirical. Have you, have you heard of Tom Dara? I read that there was rumors about it. You've heard of Tom Dara the Great? satirical songwriter of, um, of Harvard University and other places. 
said on the day that Henry Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to satire had nothing further, <coughs> further to say. Uh, so I suppose, why not? But I mean, uh, 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 happily I'm not. Happily for me, happily for the world, happily for the Nobel Committee, I'm not on it. Uh, yes, please. Forgive me, I, I think I've had some trouble following the argument. So it, it seems to me... Sorry to hear that. There are two separate <laughs> um, One is about whether, in principle, it's right to, to intervene, you know, to encroach on another nation's sovereignty and so on. And then, if you like, there's a separate set of claims about whether it's pragmatically a good idea to do so. And it seems to me that perhaps the conclusion that you're arguing for is the one that it's in principle bad to encroach on another nation's sovereignty. But it seems to me that the kind of reasons you've been giving us have been for the other, which is that often we don't have the right kind of information for it to be pragmatic for us to do. Or often people give the wrong kinds of moral justification when actually they're motivated by immoral justification or something else. No, it's, it's surprising how often principled actions turn out also to be the practically successful ones, uh, and, and quite gratifying sometimes. But I think there are, that if, you, if you have a principle, I, it's a, it flows in my view from, from this belief that the nation state is the largest unit in which it's possible for human beings to be effectively unselfish one another, to organize themselves under jointly agreed laws and customs in such a way that they can create a civilization. And that therefore the, the sovereignty of the nation state and its, 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 its security from intervention by outside forces is <coughs> itself a good to be desired, and one from which this country has benefited enormously. And so from that principle, then, then I say, if, if I don't myself wish to be intervened in, then I can't really, on the same principle, allow myself to intervene in other countries. I can then give you, because most people <coughs> regard intervention uh, idealistically, they quite rightly, they see something horrible going on and they feel a desire to do something about it. The comparison is often made, you see someone over there being mugged, would you intervene? I hope so. Uh, I have done, but it got me a black eye and no good. But it, 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 I'm not sure I'd do it in the days when knives are more common, but it's, it is a simple thing and you, you're, you're quite likely to fulfil your intention by doing so. But the problem is that intervention in foreign countries isn't as simple as intervening in a mugging. Uh, it's about five million times more complicated and the, the, the outcome is much more unpredictable and the outcome is very likely to be bad. So not merely is there a good principle for saying don't do it because if you don't, if you don't want it done to yourself you can hardly do it to others. There's also good practical reasons for those who find that principle onerous and repellent which I don't blame people for finding. It's not, it's not necessarily attractive when someone says there is, there's evil going on over there, but I think you shouldn't intervene in it. I don't, uh, this, this is not courting popularity here. But is that clear? I know we tell our journalists who tend to be quite confusing and verbose, but uh, ha, ha, this, is that, does that answer the question? Yes, but not very well. Well, okay, in that case, I'll have to put it on somebody else. Um, I think it's up to you. Do you think uh, security council should be improved, uh, especially uh, in uh, Japan or uh, Taiwan or India? Uh, if, if I have it right, you, 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 you're asking what, whether I think that the, security, the United Nations Security Council should be should, should have other members apart from the uh, yes. I, I think it inevitably will. Uh, because I don't think the existing members membership can be, which is based on the position in 1945, <coughs> can be sustained. Uh, but I think that it would be difficult uh, to create a security council as small and therefore as effective as the one that we have now, uh, because so many people would buy to be members of it. Um, as I say, I, I myself don't really favour the existence of the United Nations. I think it's it is in itself an implicit <coughs> attack on national sovereignty, it's, it, it, its very existence, and I'm, I'm not sure it does, uh, if, if I'm fairly sure it does more harm than good. But I think, it, I think what you talk about will happen. I think, for instance, that the European Union uh, will eventually demand a seat, and that that will create great difficulty <coughs> with seats held by Britain and France. I think that at some point or other, the United States will try and remove the Russian seat. But I, 
it, it's it's a battle yet to come. I, I think it's <coughs> inevitable that it will. Uh, I, I don't really have any opinions on whether it should. Okay. Oh, yes, please. Uh, if you think that we shouldn't intervene in other countries, do you think we should have armed forces at all, apart from maybe abroad in the West Coast Guard? Oh, no, very much so, because armed forces are to deter attacks on them. And particularly if you are an, an island country, which is incredibly dependent upon the freedom of the seas uh, for its existence and prosperity, uh, you certainly <coughs> need a strong navy. Uh, and I would say you, you needed an army which was capable of, uh, of undoubtedly capable, and was known by any potential enemy to be capable of fighting a pretty considerable battle against an invader. So yes, I, but I, I, I would certainly like to see a very comprehensive defence review in which our armed forces were redesigned for those purposes, because at the moment they seem to be, to be a mixture of, of, uh, of power projection in distant places, uh, interventionist forces, uh, and leftovers of all kinds of, of, of dead ideas, and also uh, a covert way of protecting uh, certain British industries by giving them contracts. So uh, it, it, it is a, a, no sovereign country uh, should neglect strong, effective, modern armed forces from a deterrent point of view. They should be so good that nobody wants to risk fighting them. Anyone else? Well, to be on to previously <coughs> played with territory, so for example in South China Sea where you've got thousands of islands and waters there which have been disputed by China and multiple other countries which don't have a categorical answer for that in the sense that they're both disputing the same thing. What will happen to something to that? I don't know. A, a, a distinguished journalist, known to me, uh, recently uh, travelled for a certain publication which I can't name uh, to that part of the world, examined the Spratly Islands and all the <coughs> conflicts there, and said that he thought that the Far East currently resembles Europe in 1913, uh, and that there are all kinds of conflicts waiting to boil over. I don't know. I hope, I hope that they, the countries involved have the sense uh, to, to resolve the diplomatic that I think there are major conflicts possible there, but it's, um, it's a separate question. Yeah, I'm sure the principle of certainty and authority is obviously there for there isn't really a place that goes. Well, it doesn't stop you negotiating over where your sovereignty begins and ends uh, if, the, if, if, if the alternative is war. And war is hell. And you only resort to war when you absolutely have to. And diplomacy is, <coughs> diplomacy is absolutely essential. And, but diplomacy will not be effective unless you're capable of fighting war. I think it was Frederick the Great who said that, <coughs> that diplomacy without armed forces was like music without instruments. Uh, so you have to have that, and the threat of it has to be there. Uh, but that's why you need grown ups in the Atlantic Coast. And I have to say, I don't think that our current foreign secretary is particularly grown up. I would like to see somebody rather. You know, historically informed and, and level-headed in the job, and in general, I think that, that, that would be good. One hopes, after the, the horrors of, the, of, of Manchuria and the, the, the Chinese Civil War and everything else that, that were inflicted on, on the Far East, and indeed the, the, the Japanese invasions of so many countries after 1941, uh, one hopes that there won't be any more there. But it's not, the sovereignty issue doesn't necessarily need you to have war. You can avoid it. And, Indeed, Europe between 1815 and 1914 avoided it very successfully. Just to say we're rather past the time, so we could just have one or two more questions. Yeah, um, I'm afraid. I, I think we're nearly done. Anyway. So could I... Um, who really, really wants to ask a question? Okay. Um, you and you, and then that'll have to be it. So you first, please. Could you shout? Because I'm not going to do no, not in its current form. Uh, I think in its current form, it's a ludicrous Cold War weapon. Uh, I think we should keep a nuclear capacity, but it should be much more modest. Uh, and it, the, the, there's no need to have these patrolling submarines and this vastly expensive multiple uh, warhead thing designed to baffle the, uh, the, the Russian, uh, well, the, the, the the anti-ballistic missile screen around Moscow, and that's all it's for. Uh, 
uh, which is enormous and which used to get very much in the way of us having picnics in the woods outside Moscow because so many of the woods had missile batteries in them and the police would come and chase us away. Uh, it's not, we don't need, we're not going to, we're not, we have absolutely no need to bomb Moscow. I can think at the moment of no circumstance in which we would need nuclear weapons, but I, on the other hand, I recognise that it's possible that we might. So we should maintain the capacity to make warheads, uh, we should <coughs> examine the possibility of, um, of ordinary aircraft delivered missiles or, of, um, or, or, or perhaps cruise missiles. The main thing I learnt about nuclear weapons during the Cold War, which included for me a, a weekend spent in the Polaris submarine, was the whole point of them is that they must never be used. Um, but the, they, their possible use must simultaneously be credible. The reason for Polaris and Trident was that was to make those weapons credible against the Soviet Union. The Soviet <coughs> Union no longer exists. We don't need weapons that were designed to deal with the Soviet Union. So a much reduced, uh, a much reduced nuclear force would be would be perfectly wise and practical. And then we also have more money to spend on effective conventional forces, which actually in our time of life would be much more useful. The other thing we would have money to spend on would be nuclear power stations, because the energy threat. Uh, actually very successfully used by Vladimir Putin against Ukraine. <coughs> the energy threat is a much, much greater one against this country, and it's a much more usable one uh, than the threat of nuclear weapons. Uh, and it's you. Um, you mentioned in passing that you are <coughs> very keen on democracy. I'm just wondering if you think that it's the worst system until you try to think of a better one, or if you, like, have another one. Well, it's interesting. The it seems to me that what, what really makes our lives different from those in repressive countries is not the right to go into a booth every five minutes <coughs> and um, be treated as a thief and illiterate, be given a pencil which is on a string so you can't take it away, and asked to write a cross because you can't write anything on a piece of paper which names several people who have already been chosen by other people, uh, one of whom will win the election, whatever you do. Uh, it doesn't seem to me to be a, a, a particularly attractive proposition. I haven't voted for years. I regard it as a waste of time. I don't go to shops and buy goods I don't want. I don't go to polling booths and vote for parties I don't like. Uh, but leaving that personal feeling aside, uh, the, the, again, the characteristics of those societies which have been most successful, where, which have had the most free speech and thought, which have had the most freedom of action, which have allowed their, their, their subjects or citizens to develop as, <coughs> as human beings, as, as, as people of conscience, have been countries in which freedom has been the principle. And freedom as embodied, for instance, in both the English Bill of Rights of 1689, the Petition of Right, Magna Carta, uh, the, American, the American Bill of Rights of 1789, and these, these of, of 17, actually earlier than that, wasn't it? Um, the, these which are documents which don't talk airily about, about uh, vague, nebulous rights, but which set upon government's limits and say government may not do the following things. And that's what those documents are immensely valuable. And also jury trial, uh, which prevents the state being, uh, being wholly in charge of whether anyone goes to prison. Jury trial is an immensely precious possession, which we don't defend anything like enough worth, to me, 500 times as much as the vote, uh, and now actually very much under threat in this country. These are the important distinct, dis distinguishing marks. These are the, the things which have made the Anglosphere the, the, the immensely successful series of, of, of free societies without torture chambers or political prisons, which they are. Democracy is a very recent experiment. In fact, the original US Constitution did not allow for an elected Senate because the Founding Fathers specifically wanted to protect their upper house from what they call the fury of democracy. Um, they wanted to emulate the House of Lords. And the US Senate wasn't I I elected until, uh, as far as I recall, the, I think the 17th Amendment uh, passed in 1913, uh, just as this country didn't become fully democratic until the representation of the People Act of 1948. It would be hard, it seems to me, to say that, this, that, that either the United States or Britain were not free at times when they were not fully democratic. So I think there's another, one other small point about this. Anybody who's visited the People's Republic of China and who's visited Hong Kong will note the immense difference between the two in, 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 in the, the freedom of speech before or after the handover. Uh, freedom of speech, rule of law, 
corruption, and also the genuine general cleanliness, efficiency, and, <coughs> and, and, and quality of, of, of government, public services, and everything else. Hong Kong has never been democratic, but it has for, for a very, very long time been free. And this is again the distinction, and I, I'm, the confusion that people make between democracy and freedom, as if they were the same thing, uh, is, is extraordinarily lazy. <laughs> A democracy can, often does, threaten freedom. It's democracy which enabled the passage, for instance, of the Homeland Security Act in the United States. It's democracy which has enabled the, the equivalent supposed anti-terrorist legislation in this country, which has hugely curtailed our liberties and hugely increased the power of the state, because democracy can be packed into unwise decision. So I think people should just learn to distinguish between freedom and democracy. Liberty from the state, the, the serious legal limits on the power of the state, the fact that the law is above power, that there is a genuine rule of law, these are, and then jury trial, the presumption of innocence, these are immensely precious possessions. Democracy, frankly, you can keep it. And that, I think, will have to be the end. <laughs>